Welcome to another Under the Night Sky. My name is Robin. Tonight, we're going to explore the constellation of Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. I'll talk about how to find Corona Borealis, some deep sky objects located in the constellation, and some of the myths associated with the crown. By late August, the sun is setting a few minutes after 8 o'clock. By 9.15, 9.30, you'll be able to see the stars of Corona Borealis high in the western sky. Corona Borealis is a small, pretty little constellation in the northern celestial hemisphere. Its brightest stars form a semicircular arc that looks like a crown or a tiara. It's surrounded by three constellations that I have shared in previous Under the Night Sky videos. Using these will help you find the Northern Crown. The first of these constellations is Bootes, the herdsman. Bootes is to the north and west of Corona Borealis, with the crown just off the right shoulder of the herdsman. If you can't find Bootes, remember to follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle and arc to Arcturus, the bright star in Bootes. Just above and to the east of Corona Borealis is Hercules. Serpent's Caput, or the head of the serpent being held by Ophiuchus, is to the south of Corona Borealis. As you can see, the crown is neatly tucked in between these constellations. I've mentioned in previous Under the Night Sky videos that when we talk about stars and deep sky objects in a constellation, we don't necessarily mean that the star or object is located within the lines marking the pattern of the constellation. The object might be within the lines, but it could be outside these lines and within the border of the constellation. The sky is divided into 88 constellation regions. Think of it as equivalent to the state being divided into counties. Every star we see and every deep sky object lies within the border of one of these 88 constellation regions. Here we see the border of Corona Borealis. Within the border are a couple of interesting stars. The first is T Coronae Borealis. The star is south southeast of the star labeled Epsilon and just inside the border of Corona Borealis. The star isn't visible to the naked eye, but can be seen in a three-inch telescope and binoculars. T. Corona Borealis is a variable star nicknamed the Blaze Star. I'm going to call it T. On the left is how Corona Borealis looks now. We can't see T. On the right, I've added a star to demonstrate what T might look like in an outburst. A variable star is a star whose brightness, or its apparent magnitude, fluctuates as seen from Earth. The variation is typically caused by an actual change in the light being emitted because the star is periodically swelling and shrinking in size, or by something partly blocking the light, like a passing planet in front of the star. T is a different type of variable star, and one of only about 10 stars in the entire sky that's classified as a recurrent nova. T is usually about a tenth magnitude star. Magnitude is the measurement of a star's brightness. The lower the number, the brighter the star. For instance, the sun's magnitude is about negative 27. In May 1866, T brightened to a magnitude of 2, visible to the naked eye and outshining every star in Corona Borealis. It quickly faded, and then 80 years later, in February 1946, it brightened again, reaching a magnitude of 3. Once again, it quickly faded to a 10th magnitude star. So what's going on with this star? T is a binary star, a red giant star in a close orbit with a planet-sized white dwarf star. Gas spills from the red giant and accumulates in an accretion disk around the white dwarf star. This is essentially a mass transfer from a normal star to the small but gravitationally powerful white dwarf. Some of the gas is funneled down to the dwarf surface where it's compacted and heated and eventually ignites in a thermonuclear explosion, resulting in a nova-like outburst. 
Current predictions for this star have its next explosion happening in the time frame of 2023 to 2026, 2026 being 80 years after its last explosion. You might want to keep an eye on Corona Borealis. It would be awesome to see this star appear and then fade from view. The other star of interest in this constellation is R. Coronae Borealis, which I will call R. This is a photo of R. Discovered over 200 years ago, R is on the edge of naked eye visibility. At its brightest, it's a magnitude 6 star and another unusual variable star. In fact, it is the prototype for the R. Coronae Borealis class of variable stars. This class of variables dims instead of brightening. They fade away at random intervals and return to their full brightness weeks, months, or even years later. For instance, at irregular intervals a few years or decades apart, R fades from its normal brightness of sixth magnitude for a period of months or sometimes years. There's no fixed minimum, but R has become fainter than 15th magnitude. R typically starts to return to maximum brightness almost immediately from its minimum, although this is occasionally interrupted by another fade. Most R-class variables are yellow supergiants, more than 50 times larger than our Sun. These stars have lost their outer layer of hydrogen, exposing a helium and carbon-rich atmosphere. Ours, and stars like it, are shedding huge amounts of mass rich in helium and carbon atoms into space. A small amount of this carbon condenses and cools into discrete puffs of carbon, similar to soot. This dust puff theory suggests that mass is lost from these stars and then moves away until the temperature is low enough for carbon dust to form. If one of these carbon dust clouds happens to move into our line of sight, it blocks the light of the star, causing it to dim. These clouds must expand and thin or be blown away by the star's solar wind before we see the star return to its normal brightness. More than 200 years after the discovery of our Coronae Borealis, astronomers have found direct confirmation of these dust clouds, but how and where these dust clouds form around these stars is still a mystery. Now let's look at a deep sky object, Abel 2065, also called A2065. Every object in this image is a galaxy. A2065 is a highly concentrated cluster, over 1 billion light years from Earth, containing over 400 galaxies. The cluster contains a wide variety of galaxy types and is one of several clusters used by Edwin Hubble to demonstrate that the universe is expanding. A2065 is the largest galaxy cluster in the Corona Borealis supercluster, which consists of seven galaxy clusters. It's believed that the core of the supercluster is experiencing a rapid gravitational collapse and will eventually, in billions of years, form one huge cluster. Let's move on to some Corona Borealis stories. The Ojibwa people see a sweat lodge in the stars of Corona Borealis. The sweat lodge is a purification ceremony. It's about returning to the womb and remembering and renewing a person's spirit. The teaching is that human beings are made of body, mind, and spirit, and it's the spirit that leads. In the stars of Corona Borealis, Hercules, and Serpent's Caput, the Lokino people see the spirit of the green sea turtle. The Lokino are an indigenous people of the Guianas, whose territory stretches along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean from northwestern Guyana through Suriname to northwestern French Guiana. The constellation represents the Kataro turtle swimming toward the shore. The shore is represented by the Milky Way. When the constellation appears in the morning high in the sky, it is a signal that turtles are arriving on the beaches to lay eggs. The constellation rises early in the year, but appears upside down most of the time from the location of the Lokino in the Guianas. 
By mid-March, a time when several species of turtles lay their eggs on the Atlantic coast of the Guianas, it does look like a turtle swimming to the shore. This next story is an old Norse legend of how Arvindil's toe was placed in the sky. Arvindil was a Norse warrior. It seems that Thor helped Arvindil escape from the land of the giants by carrying him in a basket on his back out of the cold north. One of Arvindil's toes had stuck out of the basket and it froze. Thor broke the toe off and threw it up to the stars where we see it today in the stars of Corona Borealis. The Shawnee call this constellation the Celestial Sisters. I found several different versions of the story. I hope you like this one. White Hawk was one of the most skillful hunters of his tribe, young, strong, and fearless. One day while hunting, he left the forest and set out across a wide plain, covered in long blue grass and flowers. He came to an area where the grass had been trampled in a circular path but there was no path leading in or out of the circle. He was curious and decided to stay to see if he could discover what made it. It didn't take long. He heard music coming from above. He looked up and saw a silver basket descending from the heavens containing 12 beautiful maidens. When the basket touched the ground, the maidens jumped out and began dancing around the circle, beating out time on a silver ball. White Hawk was mesmerized by the maidens, but it was the youngest and most beautiful that immediately captured his heart. But as soon as he moved from his hiding spot, the sisters jumped back into the basket and disappeared into the sky. White Hawk could not stop thinking about the beautiful sister who had stolen his heart. He went back the next day and assumed the form of an opossum and waited for the girls. He didn't have to wait long, but as soon as they saw him, they once again escaped in the silver basket. The following day, White Hawk disguised himself as a mouse. The youngest sister chased after the mouse, and when she was close enough, White Hawk threw off the disguise and caught her in his arms. The other sisters escaped back to the sky. White Hawk loved his wife and was the kindest and most gentle husband. As the next spring approached, they welcomed a baby boy. White Hawk was the happiest of all men. However, his wife was the daughter of one of the stars, and even though she loved her husband, she was homesick. While White Hawk hunted, she crafted a wicker basket. One day when he was gone, she took the basket and her son to the circle and sang the enchanted song. The song was sad as the basket carrying her and their son vanished into the sky. White Hawk heard his wife's song and ran to the circle, but they were gone. His anguish and despair were unbearable. After a time, his wife and son came back, and she asked him to live with them in the sky. He visited all his favorite spots one last time, coming to the circle last. He took his wife and child by the hand, climbed into the basket, and was carried up to the sky. All right, one last story. In Greek mythology, Corona Borealis is known as Ariadne's crown. It is said that King Minos, ruler of the island of Crete, was so powerful that he could demand and get whatever he wanted from the people of Athens. Each year, he demanded that the king of Athens send him the seven most handsome boys and the seven most beautiful girls. These young people would be forced into the maze where the king's minotaur lived, the minotaur being a half bull, half man creature that fed only on humans. Theseus, son of the king of Athens, asked to be sent to King Minos so that he could kill the minotaur and put an end to the monstrous ritual. Unbeknown to King Minos, his daughter Ariadne saw Theseus and fell in love with him. She gave Theseus a sword and a bowl of string. As Theseus and the others entered the maze, he began unwinding the ball of string. With each step, they could hear the minotaur. When it finally attacked, Theseus battled the beast, cutting off its head. He and the others then used the string to lead them out of the maze. King Minos and his guards were shocked to see the 14 young people come out of the maze. No one had ever returned from the maze. 
After a short battle, Theseus, Ariadne, and the other young Athenians escaped. On their way back to Athens, their ship stopped at the island of Naxos. During the night, Theseus received a message in a dream, telling him that Ariadne had been promised to a god and that no mortal should interfere. Theseus and the others set sail immediately, leaving Ariadne behind. When Ariadne awoke and realized that she had been abandoned, she cried. As she sat crying on the beach, the god Bacchus saw her. Through her tears, he saw her beauty. He begged her to marry him. She said no and didn't even believe he was a god. Bacchus then produced the most beautiful golden crown set with sparkling jewels she had ever seen. Eventually, Ariadne did marry Bacchus, and they lived a long and happy life together. When Ariadne died, Bacchus placed her crown high in the sky to honor her for her kindness to Theseus and to him. Well, that's it for another Under the Night Sky. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed exploring Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown, with me. Join me next month when we explore the constellation Capricornus, the Sea Goat. Thank you.